it made me realize how important that was. You know, we're we're mammals. We are not supposed to sleep alone. We are we are joined. We are we are made to be part of a pride or a pod or a whatever you call it. And we've sort of worked society to be members of one. And I can function as a member of one. I can survive as a member of one, but I can't thrive by myself. Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast, a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy with yours truly, Michael Kahan. Wow. Today's guest was simply a treat. Diane is extremely compassionate and conscious. I absolutely love her mindset and philosophies on life. She's a super empowering lady and my God, I wish I had a couple more hours to chat with her. What springs to mind when thinking about Diane is flow and resilience. She has profound insights and I'm sure you'll love her as much as I do. So let's officially introduce Diane Farr, who can do it all, to the podcast. She's an award-winning actor as well as an author, writer, producer and soon-to-be director. She currently stars in the hit show Fire Country as Sharon Leone. You may also recognize her from her roles as FBI agent Megan Reeves in Numbers, Jill Robinson in Californication, the firefighter Laura Mills in Rescue Me, Maya in Splitting Up Together, as well as Charms, The Good Doctor, Chance, Blackish, Private Practice, Like Family, The Job, Roswell, The Drew Carey Show, Grey's Anatomy, and The Mentalist, to name a few. Diane was also a co-host for 200 episodes of the advice program Love Line on MTV alongside Dr. Drew and Adam Carolla. She is also the author of two books, Kissing Outside the Lines and The Girl Code, The Secret Language of Single Woman. So as you can imagine, we dive deep and we cover a lot, such as working at a maximum security prison, directing good versus bad, meeting people where they're at, her spiritual journey, intuition, grief, collaboration, belief systems, and ambition. Before we get into this chat, in case you aren't aware, the videos are now available on YouTube under Michael Kahan. That's Kahan with a K, unless you're listening to it already. I find it adds a new element and dynamic to these chats. I'll still be posting snippets of these chats on Instagram under Funny and Failure, So check them out if you want to stay in the loop for upcoming episodes or you want to ask a guest a question. I'd also love it if you would share the podcast or share your takeaways from the chat. It really motivates me, helps the podcast grow and ensures I can lock in amazing guests like this one. And just as a final reminder, the podcast comes out every Monday at 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time with the video to follow the following day. Anyway... Sit back, relax, and enjoy today's epic episode. Oh, this could be a funny way to start. I heard that you taught at a maximum security prison. Can you please tell me why you did that? (laughs) Mm, I I think the short answer is money. I was a uh, struggling artist. I just moved to LA from New York. And I I don't even understand really how I got the job, but I think I like storytelling and I was sitting with one woman who works with another woman. And then she said, you know, I think you'd be a really good teacher. And I said, I hate teaching. I I hate the pressure of teaching. And especially if it has anything to do with acting, because the question is always, do you think I will make it? I'm like, I have no idea. I don't even know if I'm going to make it. Have I made it? So I I didn't want to do that at all. And she said, but I have 30 students. And I was like, you have 30 students who want to learn acting? And she said, yeah. I said, why? Are you in a church group? And she said, no, it's a maximum security men's prison. Uh, And, you know, I'm I'm like 120 pounds soaking wet. I was like, really? You you want to send Barbie into prison to teach? Ken dolls who came with polyonids, who came with the, you know, the, the parts that Ken was missing on the doll. She said, yeah. So match made in heaven. This, it was really good. I got this massive contract, one of the 
biggest clauses in it was the no negotiation clause, which meant if I was taken hostage by my class, the state would not negotiate for my return. <laughs> I had to get like a, wow. I had to get a TB shot in case I was bitten. There were so many things. What? It got so to the point of like, you know, you like even with Twitter at the moment going so crazy, there's so much like us and them conversation of, or good guys and bad guys, black and white thinking. And at a certain point I was like, I just, I just have to see what it is, what it's like. And it was at the time, California had a three strikes rule, which basically said, if you got in trouble for the same thing three times, you went to jail for life, no matter what it was. And at the time, a lot of it was narcotics. A lot of it was like pot that is now legal. If people were caught dealing pot and it wasn't large amounts of pot, it was like, you know, a kid on the corner trying to make lunch money pot. Um, so it was a lot of those people. And it was a, it was boys who were either too old to stay in juvie, uh, the young person's prison, or they were on their third time. So they were being tried as adults, but they were kids. So it ended up being boys between 13 and 21 who were supposed to be in prison for life. It was a That's god crazy. awful situation when I got in there and there was no good guy or bad guy. They, they were... They were growing up in such poverty. They had so few opportunities in front of them. There was no other choice for them to survive. That's how they got in there. And that became clearer and clearer every week. I was supposed to do scene study with them. On the second time I went in, somebody cued me to ask how many non-readers I had. And in a room full of 30 men, 25 of them couldn't read. Wow. I never met an adult who couldn't read like that's how badly our system had failed them so they had no way to make a living they had no way to sustain themselves they were insolvent without the choices they were making and i was like okay we're gonna do improv <laughs> because nobody could read uh, okay i've written down also 100 points one, like, kudos to you, especially when they're talking about all these clauses, like, no biting clause. I would say, like, oh, what, what's going on here? And no negotiation clause. Then I'm sure the mind spirals, like, oh, does this happen often? And there's probably, like, 200 things on that list. But still, like, kudos to you. What did you take out from that experience? Because, you know, we talked about good and bad, and I think that's you said that so beautifully. What, I, it's something that I struggle with with very quick to label someone as bad, but we don't know their uh, circumstances, their experience. Was it a one-off? I know that it talks about the three um, chances, but still for like something like weed, it's crazy. So what, mm -hmm. what did you take out from that experience? Uh, the thing I took off at the time was we were failing as a society to hold everybody almost like in this Dostoevsky sort of way, like you can look at where a society is based on how they treat the people who get the least out of it. How are you treating your prisoners? How are you treating differently able-bodied people? How are you treating the elderly? Um, it, it was really, it was, I guess, the beginning of white privilege. It was the beginning of understanding I had a lot of things handed to me that uh, I didn't understand. What I see now, you know, many years later, is that we're all probably on a spiritual journey and that we probably have like set up a paradigm. We've set up a play, like maybe a pact between me and the universe of what do I need to happen in front of me for me to know myself, for me to know me well enough that I can be service to other people. Like I really got to understand what I'm afraid of to get past it so I can get good at the things I'm good at so I can be of service to the whole, to the greater good. Mm -hmm. So even at the time, it was very clear that I, I couldn't have any pity for these people. They did not, they did not want any pity that that felt like judgment wrapped up with a uh, side of you're never, you're never going to succeed no matter what. So now I look at it like pity assumes that I have a better I have a better paradigm going on than them. <laughs> I was like, they have the perfect paradigm to learn what they need to learn about themselves. And uh, I'm just a witness to it. 
Oh, I think that is so lovely. And, you know, we do need, we won't get into politics or the world or anything, but we, every side of the spectrum, we all need a bit of compassion and be able to see someone where they're at is how mm. people grow and learn. And mm. I think that's just something that I think about, especially when I'm in the judgmental space or I'm saying, oh, I'm not that I'm better than, I don't think anyone's better than me. I think we're all equal, as you said, but I think that's such an important mindset. And if we all held that for long periods, the world would completely change. Oh, yes. But I still think it's so great because yes, you're going through an experience like that. This is still not an easy prison. There's still people where you'd come from fear. I'm sure there's like rapists and pedophiles and murderers and blah, 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 blah. How did you remain like calm and actually like want to help? Because it's one thing to have the compassion, but fear would also maybe kick in, especially with that long laundry list of things that we just discussed. <laughs> um, they weren't that far apart from me in age. I didn't feel that they were boys and some of them were really big and some of them were really strong. But I, I, we were only like, you know, five, six years apart. Um, I think the biggest thing that I knew going in was I, I had to, uh, had to make my voice big enough that the world we were existing in, in the classroom was not the same world that they existed in outside that classroom. And the truth of things are, is I think boys are better equipped for this. I, I later went on to teach oh, unwed teenage mothers in Los Angeles. I did a course on myth building with them. I found Ooh. out later, it was, it was run by the same woman who was running the prison. I found out later, most of those young girls were having babies with those same boys. It was it was a collection of people stuck in an underbelly where they had no chance of getting out. And a teenage pregnancy was going to keep them there generationally. The boys could come in a classroom, and I, I think because of the team sports they were playing, they could leave whatever was happening in the yard or whatever was happening in the lunchroom outside of their acting class. Interesting. The girls didn't have that same feeling whatever was whatever drama was going on it would come into the classroom and i really thought like oh i think we're we're doing the the girls a disservice with the sports at the time at least that we were pushing them towards or what it is to be a team or what it is to like team build about something and let everything else go um so um what was your original question i forgot We've we've gone on tangents. I've also forgotten the sense was about um ah, safety. How did yes, I stay yes, safe? Yes. I knew so I knew I had to like make it not exist outside. And I I thought at the time is I had to have the largest the largest voice in the room. There was only one time where somebody made a joke about a doorbell. So I think I had bent over or something and behind my body. The guy didn't touch me, but he physically like made a move like he was pushing a doorbell with his finger and he must have done it near my bum. Wow. And I heard the other kids saying, doorbell. That's and like three quick, <laughs> Yeah. I like quickly figured out like what must have happened. And I was like, all right, come on up here. I need you and you. We're going to do a doorbell. Here's the door. You're on this side of the door and you're on that side of the door. Let's see what happens. Like I, I tried to take where they really were and make it part of the class, which kept the status out of it. I'm the teacher. You must speak to me this way. It was like, oh, this is where you live. This is an art class to give you another way to express yourself. Let's see if we can do it. Um, it worked really well. That's how I stayed out of the fear. I just had to keep addressing the things as they came up, which I, I think so much of what we do is to avoid the truth because we think we're going to be more vulnerable. And sometimes the, the lie or the thing that we do to hide from the uncomfortable feeling is what actually gets us in trouble. That's so interesting. And I really like that awareness that you are equal and also being in a, like a prison system, whether it's the myth um, teaching one as well, is that status probably wouldn't work also in a prison environment because that they would also come from fear, but also to have like the wherewithal to, do improv and just mm -hmm. get them back into the place. So they're probably not in there like fear or um, fight or flight or whatever they're in. That's really impressive. 
did that just come naturally to you? Did you have some training before? Because not many people would act in such a <laughs> like profound way. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. Um, I grew up in a rough house. I grew up in today what I would call an alcoholic house. So there was like a lot of chaos in the house. And as a little kid, you develop all these strategies to avoid having the light shining right on you, to avoid somebody's ire or somebody's uncomfortableness directed at you. So I definitely learned a lot of like dodge and ditch of what's going on, like how to keep things at an even tone before they spiral, mm -hmm. which, you know, if it's not in an extreme is an asset more, more than a defect. If I spend my whole life avoiding conflicts or avoiding uh, a disaster in the natural course of things, then I'm not living in truth either. So I think that's where I got it. I, I knew what it was like to be in a slightly dangerous environment. And I knew I could use my, my words to sort of change the tide of how the room was going. That's very cool that you, like, okay, you said a few buzzwords and it's kind of similar. I'm not comparing anyone to anyone. I've noticed kind of like my mom grew up in a similar environment to that and like the weaving and the dodging and the language needed. You know, mm -hmm. obviously it may have not come from the best situation, but it's such an important skill to be able to, like you said, the word living your truth and just mm -hmm. having that, that's, that's a very powerful buzzword. Um, this might be a bit loaded, but when did you kind of like start on what sounds like your own personal connection or your spiritual journey? Was it through experience like that or was it later on in your life? Uh, when I was 27, my best girlfriend died in my apartment of SIDS like sudden infant death syndrome, her heart just stopped. Wow. And that was like a huge turning point. You know, I was, I, I gave the eulogy at her funeral oh. and it felt like there was my life up to 27 and then there was my life after. And as a single woman who was very ambitious and mostly f focused on my career, my best girlfriend who was my roommate was sort of like my equivalent of a life partner. Like that was as, as close as I got to someone at that time when I was so focused on work. So as, as the universe would have it, as my paradigm would have it, six months before my college roommate had died of cancer, I hadn't talked to her in years, but when she died, everybody that we lived with, everyone on the floor and everyone on the house got together and then six weeks after my best girlfriend died my college roommate in england i did half of university in new york and i did half of it in england my college roommate in england her husband died in a lorry accident so i had three 27 year olds die in the same year of my life and it was really loud it was really it really made me wonder, what am I here for? What do I want someone to say at my eulogy? Is it going to be that she worked really hard? <laughs> Is that how I want to sum up my days? I was, I was never a person who was dying to get married and have kids and be a homemaker. That was not, home was not the safest place for me. It wasn't something I was racing to rush into. My career was really important. Travel was really important. I, I felt like a student of the world. I didn't I didn't get some of the larger humanity lessons at home, but moving around and seeing what was valued in every culture really gave it to me. But the the deaths in my 27th year were the huge wake up call. It began my spiritual process and it began with reading all kinds of books. Um, the Australian book, Mutant Messages Down Under. Was, oh, okay. I haven't heard of that one. Oh, it's really good. It's just like a, I, I can't remember if she's American. She ends up going for a walkabout with Aborigines and she's shedding things as she's going. Um, uh, there was a whole bunch of them at the time. And this was in the, I guess, the late 90s. So there was conversations with God. There was, there was, it was the beginning of like a spirituality outside of religion with like no organized focus oh, and wow. nobody... Yeah. yeah, telling you how to do it. And then it just continued from there. And lots of therapy. <laughs> yes, that's, <laughs> like, that's always the case. 
Oh, it's so good, the therapy. I like it a lot. I'm glad and I'm a big proponent. There's so many different types of therapies and I always encourage people to find the best one for them. It's massively helped me. I've, I've gone through some more alternative ones, but it's been unbelievable. But from the spiritual journey side and going through an exper experiences like that is hectic and that could bring out some of our, like our shadow side, for example, and some of our potentially our negative thoughts or we can go to addictions or we can go to things that aren't serving us when we see death like that, especially when it's that close to home. And for you to like go the other way and actually want to flip the switch and go like how best can, as you said, serve others. I think that's also really rare and really cool. But within that and through my experience and everyone that I've spoken to, when we start the journey of let's call it self-awareness, everything changes. Like the, you look at the TV, it's not the TV anymore. You walk outside, you notice the sky's different. And that can be super overwhelming. And especially if we don't have support systems to kind of like guide us along the process. So do you remember what you're going through at the time? Was it just like laser-like vision? I need to accomplish something or do something or figure this world stuff. Or did you kind of have an environment where you could like discuss and talk and mm. be a part of it? Um, uh, I always think that grief is my, my best teacher. I know it's supposed to be love, but grief is definitely my best teacher. The first year of grief when you lose someone is so forgiving because it's, it's like depression light. It just, it just takes it off the edge of trying to get things done. It, it took the edge off my ambition. I just didn't have the bandwidth for much. It's like I could do the next indicated action. I could do the next thing in front of me. My to-do list got much shorter. I would have to sleep more. I would have to eat more because I was in grief. So I knew why I was doing it. I wasn't spending any time analyzing it. And it, it sort of gave me the beginning of walking outside and seeing the sky at all, as opposed to just running to the next task. So... <clears throat> That first year of grief for me, because it was a young person and because it was a friend, I felt super connected to her. So I felt like I had a little bit of a guardian angel. And it wasn't like some old, mysterious white male god. It was like my friend who was like silly and, and you know, fun. So I had her to talk to all the time. And I spent a lot of time talking in the car. Like driving became its own form of a meditation. And I think at the end of the day, I am a, a truth seeker. So I want to talk till John. I just want to get to the truth of a thing. So I, I was making my own environments to talk with different people at different times. Um, I didn't have... I didn't have a bereavement group per se, but someone had told me that I could walk off my grief, that you could use hiking and walking as a form. So I did these little hikes three days a week. I'm in Los Angeles, so it's warm here. Three days a week, I would do a little hike for about 30, 40 minutes. And on Sundays, I would do these big hikes in the mountains in Santa Monica. And I was having conversations with my friend who had passed on those walks and in the car. So that became like a daily constant, and that went on for a really long time. And over time, it felt like I, I let her sort of ease back into the consciousness. I let her ease back into what we'd call the universe or a, a higher power, something where it just felt like it was part of the collective. And I think I see myself as part of that collective. I'm just one arm of it here. And it's like, well, what do I want to do with my, my closeness to source? What do I, how do I serve? How do I do things? So I, I was definitely talking, but I think the thing that helped me most was I wasn't trying so hard. It wasn't, I wasn't ambitious in the way that I was before. And I call it depression light because it, it wasn't a kind of depression that I felt like I needed to solve. It was a kind of depression that felt like I knew it was going to end. I knew I was not going to stay in grief forever. So I just let it run its course. I wasn't fighting the low period. That's awesome because when we're in like these tricky situations, Sometimes we can try and like fight off the wave, but if the wave's coming, you have to kind of go with the wave. Yes. But so many interesting things. 
you talked about being a very, and you are an ambitious to be able to do everything that you've done in your career. You have to be very ambitious, but you said that you changed that relationship with ambition. Was the previous ambition, I'm just throwing out words, was it more of a fear I need to achieve this or was it just not having quite that purposeful idea of where you want to go? I think it was the first, I, I think it was, I will have worth if I achieve this. I think my worth was entirely tied into if I'm successful, I'll be okay. And if I, if I didn't have a family system that I felt like I could lean on, I was going to need my own security net. I think some of it was comparing my insides to other people's outsides. I, I wanted all the tangible bells and whistles. I wanted the safety of a safe car. I wanted a big house. I, I wanted the doors to open that it seems like open for fame. I wanted to be able to travel at will. I wanted to be able to say what I needed on a set. And when my friend died, it became like, why do I want these things? What do I actually want? What I, the, the most severe loss that I had had in my life at that time was losing this friendship, was losing being seen, was losing connection. So it made me realize how important that was. You know, we're, we're mammals. We are not supposed to sleep alone. We are, we are joined. We are, we are made to be part of a pride or a pod or a, whatever you call it. And we've sort of worked society to be members of one. And I can function as a member of one. I can survive as a member of one, but I can't thrive by myself. Such a good word to thrive and you're right. Um, like I just look at my own success or people speaking on the podcast. Yes, we do the work and we work in ourselves, but it's often through the empowerment or support systems or in some capacity, our tribe, our group, our family, whatever you want to call it, that help us rise. And I've used this example before and I don't even know if it's correct, but I heard in a clip that Adam Sandler like lived with all of his roommates. And I don't know if it was, who's that big Judd Apatow? I think mm. they were roommates. It doesn't really matter, but that's just the metaphor. And as one rose, the other one rose and their success became their success and they built up together. And I thought that's kind of like a nice metaphor for life in that, yes, we can do this by ourselves. We can, as you say, thrive, but getting to the next level, it's so much nicer when it's like shared in, a, in an environment of sorts. And you can only, I, I find this empowering. I don't mean to be disempowering, but yes, we can kind of do it all, but it's not quite the same. Mm -hmm. Having, to me, it's that connection and that community that you speak about as well. And that's kind of what makes for me life worth living. I don't know mm -hmm. if you share a similar philosophy or take. I do. I do. It's like, we want to be witnessed at the end of the day. If I get it all right and I do it on my own, there's, there's joy in it. I feel like we have to have some self-love first before we can love on the outside. But uh, I enjoy it so much more with a, with a witness <laughs> of any kind. And the witness can be rotating. I, 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 I think in some ways I was programmed to believe like, you know, there was a prince that was going to come on a white horse and, and save me. And at the end of the day, I saved myself more than anybody else. But if somebody wants to ride alongside me and see it, I, there's much more laughter. There's much more joy in every occasion. I think that's so great because back in many years ago, I went to a lot of weddings and this is no disrespect to the couples. They were amazing. But a lot of the messaging was, <laughs> this person now met this person and now they're complete. And wow. I didn't like that analogy because one, it disempowers other people. And I know it's about the couple, but it's more like you weren't complete before. We're fine on our own and meeting that person, whether it's a friend or someone we want to marry or whatever, they can elevate us. And they're like, I almost see it as a bonus, but I am yeah. complete without someone else. And I really yeah. didn't like that narrative. And, you know, as you alluded to, that's kind of like, that's sprinkled within our society. Mm. We're not good enough on our own in a sense, which is not true. Mm, so true. I so agree with you. On that as well, you know, you talked about grief being a teacher, but within that death is also a teacher. It's the same thing. And death to me also means being reborn. And so mm. it sounds like you were reborn, not in like a religious sense <laughs> where you've come out and, you're Jesus. I mean, no, no disrespect, <laughs> but you've reborn in belief systems, reborn in your ambition, reborn in what you want to achieve. And I know you talked about being of service, but did it change your mentality of how you're going to approach the industry and what you were well, doing? 
That's really good. I think um, I think it took my focus from being so laser focused on a result, and it sort of gave me the beginnings of some width, like um, how to have some bandwidth. I had other interests. I, I in the first year I was super preoccupied with all the other twenty-seven year olds. I kept trying to make sure I was taking care of all the other people she lost and trying to let everybody know how important they are. I was trying to like continue a legacy, but what I was doing was splitting my focus and where I wasn't just looking at work. And then I started to work when I started trying so hard to work. I was not working yet as an actor. I was teaching acting in a prison um, right up until the end. And then a little bit after she died. So for me, I needed to not look at the target so directly. And this has happened multiple times in my life that if I get hyper-focused on anything, I I lose my connection to source. I lose my connection to my intuition. I lose my connection to whatever truth I bring to a situation. So if I'm looking at a job too closely, if I'm looking at a character too closely, if I'm looking at a boyfriend too closely, if I'm looking at one of my kids too closely, I I lose perspective. So grief was that first teacher because it forced me to deal with some of my own feelings. And then that made me like a slightly better actor to get the first couple of jobs. And they, they kept going from then. And then I was aware that the more varied things I did with my life, the more varied things I did now, I would say to understand myself, the better I got at the thing I was trying to make a living at. That is so great. And I use the example that when I used to write in a room doing screenwriting like 10 hours a day, that wasn't really achieving the goal, like depending on what one's goal is, but the goal to me is to live like a fruitful, well-rounded life. And also obviously to sell a script. But I noticed that when I walked outside of that, so whether I'm going on a walk or I'm seeing friends or I'm doing a hobby or playing basketball, the writing improved. Me having a shower, obviously I was showering, but just stepping away, that's when I get my ideas. And I found I was a better writer, this is many years ago, by doing other things. And, you know, Mm -hmm. typically we've heard this example a hundred times, but as an actor, a lot of people put their hand up and they they announce, I'm an actor and the only thing I'm doing is an actor. And I'm sure maybe you've had that experience or you've seen other actors like that. And then once they kind of let go, live other aspects of their life where they feel like there's joy there, the acting has worked. And you said something which is really interesting that, that once you let go and you didn't have that laser-like vision, you started getting more jobs and you weren't so attached. And so can you speak a little bit to that? Because that's really fascinating. Um, yeah, I think it is super fascinating and kind of annoying when you're in the middle of it, but it's the ability <laughs> to like make a left, right? Like yep. that, um, I... I grew up skiing. So I always look at it like, don't fight the mountain. As I'm going down the hill, I can ride the hill. But if I'm trying to reroute myself and make the hill do what I want, I'm going to be exhausted. I'm going to fall down. So um, at the time I wanted to work so badly, I couldn't see anything else. When I was forced to look at myself and to look at my connections to other humans and I started to play with that, I started to get more jobs years and years later, you know, the first couple of TV series, it became, well, what do you want to do with this? I think Norman Mailer said, celebrity is something you spend. It, it's like, where do you want to put your energy? What do you want to do with that platform? And now we've all become so well-versed in a platform. What do you want to say? And how do you decide what your podcast is about? And is there a greater good? Um, I've been writing for 30 years. I have a couple of published books. I wrote for newspapers for 10 years. I think I've written for every magazine on earth. Nice. And after the pandemic, I get this beautiful offer to go on this show, Fire Country, as a, a female lead and it's to play a firefighter. I've played a firefighter multiple times in my career. The one I'm most known for is Rescue Me at a time where there was very few women in the field. And I trained so hard to make sure I could represent well. 
So now I'm going to come back. It's 20 years later. I'm going to play a firefighter again. And now I'm the boss. Now I'm like the matriarch. I am not in the field. I don't, I don't have to fight the fire. Literally. I get to sort of look at all the relationships uh, on screen. And the thing I was also excited to do was write. I've, I've told about nine TV shows. None of them have made it on air yet, but I was like, okay, I think I'm definitely ready. I so love this show. Wow. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that. Yeah, go on, sir. Um, I, I'm really excited to use my voice here. And they can't work it out. They cannot figure it out. We shoot in Canada and our writers are in LA. And eventually one of the producers came and said, I think you need to direct. I, I think you should direct. And in my head, I'm like, no, I don't want to direct. I picked a lane like 25 years ago. That's my other art form. I'm an actress. It's how I earn a living. Writing is how I use my voice. It's how I storytell. But damn, if I wasn't fighting the mountain, they physically could not make it work. I'm thousands of miles, another country in a plane ride away from where they do the writing. And at a certain point, I'm, I'm highly aware of like the universe is literally gifting you a thing. It's not an easy thing. It's a thing that people aspire to. It's a gift that you're invited at all. And I'm highly aware. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be a beginner. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to start at the bottom of this. I don't want to suck at it. Not even for a day. Never mind, like probably three years if I'm lucky. And I am just looking at, like, I have to, I have to accept what's coming in. Like, I have to accept that there's a reason because at the end of the day, everything in front of me is just for me to learn about myself so I can use my voice to be of service. So on my bedside table over there, I have like, five directing books I <laughs> and love I that. have two weeks to read them. It's, it's very hard right now. And I think it's just because I don't want to be a beginner. I want to be an expert. I want to start 30 years into a thing. <laughs> is that maybe the words imposter syndrome or is it just because you've excelled as an actor for this many years, you've seen directors, it's still like the same industry and it might feel, yeah. Okay. You're nodding. Tell me what, what what's your awareness? Yeah. I think it is. I think it's also like just being attached to the result, like believing that I knew what I was supposed to do next. I knew what other art form I was supposed to look at. And I'm not getting any good feedback at the moment for that. So then it's just being willing to not be attached to the result, to not being attached to the plan that I had for myself. I, I think any of us, particularly with grief, can sit in a situation where we've lost someone and it can just be pity. It can just be self-pity. It can just be, why me? Why did this happen to me? I have never met another person who has had more death in their life than, than myself. Mm. But the 27-year-olds were the tip of the iceberg. It, it kept going. And I, I could lay down and wallow in it, but the truth is, I'm like, it's my best teacher. It's the thing that slows me down enough that I listen to what's going on around me. Um, I, I think that's why that's in my story. So that's... The, the directing one is like a happy version. Like we all understand the drama of like you've lost someone you loved. Of course, that's hard. The idea of learning a new skill that might be great as I age out of where we tell stories about women. There, there, there are less stories about women my age. I don't know how this goes on in perpetuity. If I want to continue to tell stories, I, I have to let it evolve. So. So cool. So, um, I will pigeonhole that point because I want to come back to the directing side but I've never been able to articulate to some of my friends who don't necessarily see life the same way as me. And that's, that's great. I want to be environments where we don't see the world the same way because it forms one, but I've always like, whenever something has inverted commas bad happened to me, or I haven't felt good. I've always known you might not feel it at the moment, but I've always known deep down that that experience will inform my life and I'll be better for it. And so, as you said, grief's been a great teacher for you. Some of the, huge hardships or traumas I've had. Ultimately, it's very hard in the moment, but ultimately when you look back at it and it's kind of like a puzzle piece, like, ah, because I went through that, I can now see that or that informed that. And I think it's such a beautiful way of looking at life. Doesn't mean we don't feel what's going on and go through that because that's very important. We don't bypass, which I don't think you do. But to be able to appreciate that inverted commas, the bad is just as good as the good because it comes back to your purpose and living a like free, truthful life. 
I think that's just such an easier way to live. Yes, I agree with you. Like, I feel like we live on a learning planet. So if it was all supposed to be easy, why was I born? There's nothing in nature that looks easy. You know, like even when the lion is trying to get the the water buffalo cub, you could feel bad for the lion if he misses. You could feel bad for the water buffalo's mom or the water buffalo if they're eaten. But everybody's life is at stake in there. Like, it, it's not like, oh, I don't feel like going shopping today, but I, I don't have any work, so I'll shop. It, it's like life and death. Like, there's nothing on the planet that isn't in a cycle of knowledge and and beginnings and endings. Yeah, very, very true. And on the directing side, you know, we spoke about imposter syndrome, but there's ego as well. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know how, what do you say 25 or 30 years? I've had a look at your resume. It's, it's insane. And to do as much as that you've done and to come back to what might feel like starting as a beginner level, you're not actually a beginner because you've had so much experience, you've seen it. And just also with the way that you accumulate knowledge and your awareness and what you're looking at, you're not a beginner. And even if you are a beginner, you still thrive. So have you started directing or you're about to direct? I wasn't. I'm about to. Oh, that's um, so exciting. I'm about to start shadowing, which is the first step, you know, where I'm going to do the morning top to bottom with the directors. I think the thing that overwhelms me the most is some of the the smartest actors I know, like the, the actors that do both, the actors that go back and forth. You can get super blasé about about the acting work like it once you figure out what your rhythm is and you know how to do it it doesn't i don't have a lot of prep in my work anymore especially in television you you figure out who your character is and then you're you're just trying to stay in the truth of it i'm not building it i'm not building a person from from the very beginning yeah um i watch those actors who direct working really hard, like going home and rereading the same script every night. They're the first one there in the morning. They're the last one there at night. And part of me is like, what am I missing? I have been watching directors for like 35 years as I, as I do this work. And I think I understand it. And I think I'm going to get a big lesson in humility, that there is much more to the job than I'm giving them credit for. I think my fear is stemming from my own judgment of their job isn't that hard. I I think what I have to learn is just how hard their job is. Interesting. And I think also like from the teamwork side, people will see that you're also new and it sounds like you're in a, that you've had like quite a say in this like production. And so people will respect you and the journey as well. And if you've got that environment, If it was a different situation, who knows? But you've kind of created a really nice environment where people can thrive. So I think that will work in your favor massively, plus everything else that you've done. Thank you. I think um, uh, our TV show is on CBS in America. And CBS has this big, beautiful mandate of trying to have equal representation of genders and races in directing because there has been almost zero historically there's been almost no women there's very few people of color there's almost no latin people previous to this year i don't think i'd ever worked with an asian director it was it was a very narrow uh male dominated schism so so far this year, we've had a lot of females come up, and the problem is exactly what you just said. The The environment is uninvested in them, except in theory, which gives you a little less patience as people are actually making your day longer. <laughs> so one of my producers, who's very smart and very keen, has had the idea to take women from our show who have an interest in it and pull them up for exactly what you're talking about. And I just heard Jane Fonda speaking lately about the most important thing she found as a humanitarian. And what she said was, you need a group of people. She was talking about the same thing, that you you need a group of people around you to remember you're just actually there to be of service. Each person has their part. It's not on you to do it. You can't fix it. You can't change one thing. So if I was going to go somewhere else and direct, uh, the imposter syndrome might talk me out of it. To do it on an environment where I know I would be supported, I know there's no better environment. And even though I didn't start in the kind of family who was supportive of me trying new things, maybe taking up more space 
than had I had historically, or maybe taking up more time than they had to lay out for others, that is nervous making for me. But this isn't that environment. And all that therapy has taught me, like, I'm never going to be in that environment again. It's always going to feel like it when I start. And then I have to get my adult brain to get my younger brain to be like, no, no, I got this. I can save myself. Let's see how we do. It's it's also really empowering on that as well, because we all build up. It's a journey. And, you know, you alluded to this before. Often we want to be, let's say, the world's best guitarist, but we don't, we don't want to necessarily start at being a beginner. And it's a journey. <laughs> and you're all about, it's not a short sprint, it's a marathon. And you've built up to everything. And to have the directing opportunity, which you're very humble about, is awesome. And But even to get, which will give a bit of a summary of like your career, but building up, we build up. We don't just get things like that. And I think that's mm-hmm. really important to realize that no one just wakes up and they become the world's best director or the world's best actor. It doesn't so work true. like that. Yes. And so I've written down many points and also from before. I'm very curious. You, you mentioned you sold nine TV shows. I'm just <laughs> about to sell one, which I'm very excited about. But nine, that's crazy. And... <laughs> I know you, they haven't been made and we'll, we'll get into the feelings behind that, but I, you, one of the, you've written two books and one of your books, I think you sold to, please correct me if I'm wrong, NBC. And that was mm. going to be turned. I couldn't tell if it was going to be a movie or a TV show, but it sounds like it hasn't been made. You've done this book. You poured your heart and soul. Is this the second book or first book? Is this the inter? Um, I sold done? both books. Yeah. I, the first book I wrote was called The Girl Code, and it was the secret, secret language of single women and the code of ethics amongst females. And it was sort of a story of how to stand by your lady friends, <laughs> yeah. even if you're looking for someone to date or you're just, you know, in a monogamous relationship and what is the value of them. Uh, I saw that one as a comedy, as a sitcom. And the second book um, is called Kissing Outside the Lines, and it's about interracial marriage in America. And it's funny, uh, which most people are not going to get right off the top. And uh, I married a Korean man. We have three biracial kids. We're not married anymore. But along the way to our marriage, I started interviewing couples of different races and nationalities and religions who were estranged from their family. Then the idea of the book was even democratic, progressive, educated parents are, are still sometimes teaching the last prejudice of love in the privacy of their own homes. All people are created, created equally, but you can't love this person. And the book is about the journey of how they sort of overcome it. And they sold that one first as a drama, and then I sold it as a comedy. Um, oh, wow. So- three of the, uh, that would be my single best piece of advice. If you really want to sell a TV show, write something about it first, write a newspaper article, write a magazine article, write a book, which takes a long damn time. Maybe I'm not recommending that one. Um, But then you have your own IP. You have your own intellectual property that you own, that you're selling a TV show based on that. I'm going to speak to you um, another time. You can be in my lawyer meetings. <laughs> that is great advice. Um, look, there's so much to say about your books and I heard you like talk about them and they're crazy. Each one would have informed so many aspects of your life and helped other people. Okay. So I'm going through selling this show and you know, that's my baby and you've written two books. So you've spent like a year on them. I don't know how long it's taken you. You've done so much talks. You've had You've obviously spoken with like family about this and it's your baby. It's something you poured your heart and soul. Then you have to sell it to someone, your baby. And that can be traumatic. It's also very exciting, but traumatic in the sense that you're giving up, you're giving it up. And then you said something, which is amazing that you sold it, but it hasn't been made. So what's the relationship there? Cause yeah, I won't put words into your mouth. Uh, the book part first, the book part always started as I'd be working on a set as an actor and I'd start to hate people because there's a lot of people in your face and everybody's got an opinion and somebody dresses me and somebody does my hair and somebody does my makeup, which seems lovely on paper, but is like infantilism after months and months of it where you have no say and someone's giving you the words you speak and you have to repeatedly walk from this end of the room to that end of the room. No, nope, do it faster. You like by the end of it, I want to sit alone in my little closet that is my office and make up all the words and be in charge of the whole view. So that's how the book started. 
And then when you go to sell the book, yeah, the process of getting notes. Ah, oh, notes are <laughs> <laughs> notes are like the braces of your intellectual soul. Like, well, let's just get out all the little spaces and crooked lines in there. Um, I think the pro the mindset right there has to be. It is your baby while it's alone and understanding that as soon as you set it into the world, you're aiming for it to be part of the zeitgeist. You're aiming for it to grow up and be a part of a larger collective. You cannot do that as a voice of one. So it is your baby while it's alone. And if you decide to sell it or put it out in any way, you're looking for that feedback because its appeal is going to get wider. If you, it will be perfect while it's alone in your room, just like we are perfect alone in the bath with the candle going and the meditation music. But the second I have to take myself into situations where there's going to be conflict, how much of myself can I take? How much of my book is going to live once other people's questions start to come in? But if my goal is to hit a wider audience, if my goal is to share it, I have to let that voice in. Um, so sorry let me there we go so that's my that's my hope with it then when you do the tv show version of it it's the same thing again i'm gonna there's no way you can get a whole book in this is why we generally like the books better than the movie when they become a movie there's so many themes in a book you can really run seven or eight of them at the same time and when you when you put it up on television or screen you have to pick one you have to pick one through line and run it through the whole thing so I'll go in to sell the TV show, usually in my case, from the book, and I pick one. Now, I'm going to sell them a story and a pitch, and I know how to make the world complete. It's whether or not they're buying that one worldview, that one tone, that one through line. And if they do, their ideas are going to be more, um, more developed about that one idea than mine. Yes. The TV show is no longer mine. I'm giving it to them and I'm providing a service for what they're going to sell. So now I am in of service to them. My job is not to betray my original story. Just like me as a person, my job is not to betray my truth when I come into contact with other people, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it causes conflict. I have to, I have to stay true to my internal heart. And I have to remain true to the like tent poles of the story, but I am there to be a service to someone else who bought it. So it's sort of a flip rather than looking at it like they're coming in and they're screwing with your story. There are so many artists who are like, oh, but as soon as the suits come in and start messing with our art, I, I think that's just a pity party waiting to happen. I feel like if we're trying to cook, get a collective stories, the stories that move us the most in television or movie they have a massive appeal. They're hitting like a universal truth. They come from one person's original idea. So my job is to be, um, to be an advocate for that original idea. But if I can't hear the notes coming in, it can't get any bigger than my view. That is unbelievable. And in my short time, I've had to really go from the ego side to realize that what it sounds like, it's not me versus them. It's them building upon what I've built on or what you built on and that how can we impact as many people or the right people. Mm -hmm. That is a, a journey in itself and the artist can be very, you know, you come from fear as you've spoken about, ego. No, they have to do it exactly this way. But as you said, I'm just very impressed that you were able to flip that because the amount of emotions that I've experienced, even if it was for a day, but still, you've written a book. It's still quite profound that you kind of have the mindset that we're in it to win it. It's not me against them. Mm, yeah. Very impressive. Um, okay. I reckon we'll do a very quick rapid fire segment to wrap up the podcast. And then we'll okay. have to do a part two sometime in the future because we've got so okay. much more to discuss. Um so the first thing that springs to mind, but if you need time to think about it, that's completely fine. What was the key takeaway from owning your own bar? Ha, huh. that every art form is a business in that it has to be solvent. 
And no matter what piece of art you're trying to sell, if it can't support itself, it's not meant to be. How do you deal with the rejection and the nose and the bullshit of Hollywood and this will happen and this won't happen? How do you deal with that? The rejection is just there to see if you really want a thing or you think you want a thing. And I saw that you've had the courage to leave like the odd show or whether it's love line. As we said, this industry can be a bit of fear and there's a lot of, there can be perceived perception in Hollywood. What gave you, why did you, how did you get the courage to kind of say no to certain shows or say this just isn't for me now or whatever was the case? I think it's understanding your internal truth at any given time. And I think our internal truths are supposed to evolve and change. One of the last shows I left, I left because I got pregnant with my son. And when he was nine months old, I accidentally got pregnant and it was twins. So in my first year of marriage, I had one kid. And in my second year of marriage, by the end of my second year of marriage, I had three kids and I was on a one hour drama. That's the worst schedule in the television business. It's 10 months of the year, oh, wow. 60 hours a week. It's, it's a, uh, That's it's a death call for your marriage. <laughs> but even as a parent, I was worried that my kids were going to spend all their time with a nanny and I was going to live in a trailer on a soundstage and I waited till I was almost 40 to have my kids. And I thought, no, I think I have to stay home. I, I think I have to stay home for a while. And it might kill me. It turns out I'm not a good stay-at-home mom. That's not my ride. But I had to try. So I, I asked to leave a TV show so I could stay home with my kids. Now, everybody thought I was lying. Everybody thought I was going to go on to a different TV show. I didn't. I, I stayed home for a really long time. And it was very hard. But that's where I was at that time. The show before that that I left, I left because I knew I wanted to get married. And I was moving all around the earth trying to live. And I'd watched 10 relationships fail. And at that time, I was like, am I the biggest sucker in the world? Is it the most unfeminist thing to say, I'm going to quit my giant TV show to go get married? But the truth was, that's where I was. So it's just, if I can get really honest with what I need, then I have to have the courage to do it. And the question becomes, do I have the courage to do it today? And a lot of times the answer is no. And that's just for today. So then I can ask tomorrow. I have to wait till I have the courage to do it. Um, okay. That's amazing. I want to comment on that. I'm so glad that you, um, you're true to yourself. Last two. Um, what are you most proud of? Um, I'm most proud of seeing that everything has value, even the painful things, because then everything can be utilized. It's happening for me, not to me. Love it. Uh, any advice you want to give people who want to try something different or new, but perhaps a bit fearful of doing so? Mm, I think the I think the fear is healthy. I think the fear means that you you know that you have something to lose. However, you're living now has value, but it may not have value for long. So then I think it's what I just said. The question becomes: Do I have the courage to make this change today? And that every day the answer is no, that's okay. <laughs> and then you can ask yourself again tomorrow. Amazing. Before we go, how can people follow you, keep up to date with you and check out all the amazing things that you're doing? Oh, you're so fun. I think um, Instagram at the moment is probably the easiest. It's get Diane Farr. I'm still on Twitter for the last 70 seconds that it's going to exist, but I think I'm just going to stick with Instagram right now. Um, Fire Country is the new TV show I'm on. It's in the first year here. It's the number one TV show in America. Whoa. So if it's not in Australia already, I know it's coming. We um, have a lot of audience all around the world as well. So that's. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Um, yeah. So that's, I'm on there every week now, but, uh, if you follow on Instagram, you can see anything else that I'm doing. Amazing. Thank you so much. You're amazing. I love this truth seeker and courage mentality and just asking it, being accountable to yourself, especially compassion. That's how we kind of raise the vibration of the world. So thank you so much for sharing all of that with me. And yeah, I'm so excited to connect. 
Thank you. You too. Thank you for having me. I love Diane's take on how we're all connected and that we're meant to thrive in our own tribe. She says, we are mammals. We're not supposed to sleep alone. We are joined. We are made to be part of a pride or a pod or whatever you call it. We have sort of worked society to be members of one. I can function as a member of one, but I can't thrive by myself. So I believe that belonging to aligned groups, so ones where they can positively challenge us, can give us a sense of comfort as well as help build ourselves up so that we can achieve far more than we ever thought. So for example, as an actor, a show wouldn't exist or even thrive without the director, the producer, other actors, the camera people, etc. It could be done, but it will never be as successful and light as having a good team around you. So I'll leave you with this epic quote by Dirk Wittenborn. We are the sum of all people we have ever met. You change the tribe and the tribe changes you. Thank you for listening to the Funny and Failure podcast, exploring the deeper side of comedy. (laughs) 